Oh, Happy wow. Monday, my liberty, kitty cats. And before we get into today's episode, I've got to tell you about another amazing podcast you've got to be listening to. This is brand new, relatively new, I should say. I think it just started this year in January. It is called The Independent Riot. It is hosted by my friend Jim Duncan. And each and every week, he takes deep dives with experts and madmen into all of life's most interesting topics. Uh, I have appeared on the show to discuss the ideas of libertarianism. And Jim has spoken to a host of noteworthy individuals from across the political spectrum, from political reform experts to anti-war activists, tech experts, authors, psychologists, and more. The idea isn't to tell you what's right, but to find what's right through engaging conversations. It's not left. It's not right. It's just real. Check out The Independent Riot wherever you listen to podcasts, and check it out on YouTube as well. The Independent Riot, my friends. You're not going to want to miss it. We need to empower people with not just the philosophical tools, but the inspiration to break free from the system. Welcome to the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly dose of education, inspiration, and real-world application from the top minds in the liberty movement. If you want liberty, we need to be better leaders, better husbands, better fathers, better friends, better businessmen. We need to be better people. The greatest Here's your host. Your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. And live free. I did recently read the article you posted um, about your cancer that I, I yeah. had never been really aware of that before. Would you mind getting into that a little bit? Sure. And and um, it was just a couple of years ago that my wife Terry convinced me to talk about my experience with cancer. I, I'm a I'm a cancer stage four cancer survivor. Um, I was diagnosed in 2001. And I, I went through a, a fairly dramatic experience where where I spent two weeks between diagnosis and surgery thinking that I was probably going to die because they, they thought it was a different cancer than it turned out to be. And, and once the doctor cut me open, he came out and told my wife, congratulations, we can fix this. So it, it, that ex- experience um, really Uh, dramatically changed my life in a way that I I love to tell particularly young people to appreciate um, the shortness of time that you have on the earth to do whatever it is you want to do. And if you're, if you're sort of crippled or blocked by fears that you might have, um, you know, do I take that risk? Will, what if I fail? Um, Should I do the thing I really want to do? Or should I just sort of follow the rules and, and climb the, climb the corporate ladder. Um, the point is don't waste time and don't be afraid of risk and don't be afraid of failure. Um, because once I survived stage four cancer, I was completely liberated of any hesitations I had to, to go do what I thought was the right thing to do for my life. And, and in a weird way, as tough as it was to, to get through chemo and all that stuff, it was, it was incredibly liberating for me. And I think the, the cool things I, am proud of in my own life are things that happened because um, I didn't really care if someone wasn't going to like what I was doing, if I thought it was the right thing to do. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely a philosophy or that I've been coming into a lot more um, in the last year or two. I've been really, I used to always just value whatever I needed to do, I needed to do. It didn't matter how much time it was taking. It didn't matter what it took away from my personal life. It just, whatever I felt I need to get done, I had to get done. And now I've, I've really started to look at things in a, in a different way um, in terms of just time. Like, like I can't just only see time as this commodity that I can just toss away. Sometimes I actually need to take time for what it is and realize that there is a limited amount of this available to me, uh, this commodity of time. And I really don't know when that's going to end. I think in my younger years, especially probably when I was like closer to the age, when you um, first found out about that cancer that I used to just, I feel, I felt very invincible and I still feel very invincible in many ways. Um, But we all are going to have times in our lives when we realize we're not invincible, at least not in these bodies, these bodies have an expiration date and it's going to be different for everybody. And we can't really predict when that's going to be. So uh, it can often take something, some kind of life event like happened with you to really, truly appreciate that um, in a much deeper way. Would you care to get into a little more of the details uh, about like when what it was like when you first found out, like how you actually first realized you had cancer? Um, what like, Were there certain symptoms you were experiencing or was it kind of a routine checkup? What, what kind of led to, to that in the first place? 
Sure. I was in my 30s and I was working all the time and I was in the process of taking over the world as everybody in their 30s is trying to do. And, and I started to feel like shit. Like I, I, and I, I attributed to, I, I didn't know what old age felt like, but I was, I was well into my thirties and, and for the longest time I kept just telling myself, wow, that sucks getting old because I didn't have the energy and, and I had a tremendous amount of back pain. And I, I went to the doctor a couple of times and, and they came up with nothing, but eventually this was a, this was a, it, it was a football sized tumor in my abdomen. So eventually I just noticed that there was that thing there and, and, a, and, a, and a tumor is a very different, um, it's hard. So I'm, I'm tapping on my abdomen saying, what's that? So I went to the doctor and I, I said, what's that? And at that moment, everybody freaked out and I ended up going for CAT scans and, and it, it was a, it was a massive tumor then of unknown origin because they, they won't take a biopsy for fear that, that, that the tumor might metastasize. So I, I spent two weeks waiting for surgery, um, which sounds kind of absurd now. Like I feel like if everyone's freaking out about this massive tumor in my abdomen, I might've gotten a, a quicker slot, but I didn't. And, um, and, and they thought it was a, some sort of sarcoma which essentially would have been a death sentence. And instead it turned out to be a seminoma tumor, which is, is mo you know, popularly called testicular cancer. But of course this cancer was not in my testicles. It, it, it was in my abdomen. Um, a, another blessing because a, uh, testicular cancer in the last 20 years has become very treatable. That used to be a death sentence. And because of, uh, because of new technologies that emerged, I think in the 1980s, um, it, it became very treatable, difficult that, you know, chemo is poison. And, and I basically went through the same chemo treatment that, that Lance Armstrong did. If you, if, if any, every, everyone brought me a copy of that book when I got sick, so I, I read it, but, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it was very difficult and I've, I've given, uh, at, again, at my wife's urging, I've given a couple talks relative to what we as libertarians believe in the context of my um, cancer, because one talk is about the right to try and the absurdity of the, the drug that I took, atopicide, I believe is atopicide, um, that was a discovery that took some 20 years to get through FDA approval. So if I had been diagnosed with this um, just a few years earlier, I may well have gotten a death sentence. And, and there could have been this conversation when the doctor came out of the surgery and told my wife the opposite of what he told her. Instead of saying, we can cure this, he might have said, I could cure this, except the government won't allow me to prescribe this treatment for you. And, you know, imagine if that's you, imagine if that's your daughter, imagine if that's your, your mom, um, the, the immorality of the government arbitrarily deciding that a person that doesn't have any other options can't pursue that treatment is always, always mystifying. And I remember when they were debating right to try, um, just a couple years ago, there were particularly Democrats, they were, all the Democrats were opposed probably because Trump was for it, but some of them would make the argument, um, if people, if, if people try this, um, terminal patients, they might die. So we can't let them try. And that's sort of the circular logic of, of not letting people make that choice. And, and the other thing that was sort of comical now, but frustrating at the time the chemo cocktail that I was doing was pretty devastating. It destroyed my white blood cells. It destroyed my red blood cells. I was, I shed like 50 pounds. So I was, I was um, skinny and just constantly, it, it feels like the worst hangover you've ever had, but for months on end, it never goes away. And one of, one of the now common treatments for that is medical cannabis. And I happened to live in the District of Columbia at the time, and the district had, by, by massive popular vote, legalized medical cannabis. 
only to discover that Republicans in Congress, and uh, led by uh, Bob Barr, of all people, he was a congressman at the time, he was an anti-drug warrior, and they had stripped the funding from the District of Columbia that would have allowed them to create a regulatory structure by which I could legally buy medical cannabis. So one of my Republican buddies, blue blazer, khakis and all, went out to try to score me some weed and it, <laughs> it, and it was garbage. And so I never, I never got that, that little bit of relief. He just went out to the corner you. for you, huh? And yeah. <laughs> now he, uh, excuse like, me, sir. Uh... <laughs> He, he, I mean, he, he actually knew what he was doing, but he happened to be a Republican. So I, I sort of make fun of his outfit. But he might not have gotten the good stuff then, maybe, huh? I couldn't get, <laughs> I couldn't get that relief. And so like the, you know, on both of those, those are both sort of like very personal stories that I tell that explain why healthcare freedom isn't about supply and demand. It's about people's lives. It's about whether or not um, your family can get what they need when they need it. And I think, I think one of the things that, that I'm so passionate about at Free the People is translating these, these, these libertarian ideas, uh, the ideas of Mises and Hayek and Rothbard and fill in the blank with a personal story that could actually be compelling to someone that, that thinks that the government run medicine is a really good idea. Uh, and this is such an important thing. Uh, I think especially so many of us that get into the ideas of Liberty. Uh, once we get excited about it, we start diving in and we become total nerds and we read every line of Mises of Hayek of Rothbard. We read everything. We know every single logical argument, every single reason that government interventions are harmful, every single reason that free markets are better. But those, simple sort of breakdowns those uh, they're not simple breakdowns those those scholarly breakdowns i should say aren't what compel your everyday person that you're going to meet to take on your position or even give your position the time of day because a lot of the time uh whether it's the word libertarian whether it's the phrase free market it doesn't matter because they're so they're so colored in uh sort of a, you know in previous notions uh and people aren't going to see beyond that but what does really move people uh more so than just telling them to go read Roth or go read Hayek are actual stories, are human stories. This is in the human condition. This is why the Bible is like the most popular book of all time. It's a story. <laughs> they didn't just tell you, here's the way you should live your life. They did it in the form of a compelling story. And that that's how people are moved. That's how people actually change the way they act and interact in their lives. So I'm, I'm so glad that there are organizations like yourself, uh, like yourself, at, at like yourself, like you and your wife founded uh, at Free the People that are actually focusing on, on taking these ideas is that we all think are wonderful and actually trying to translate them into stories that are actually going to compel people, actually going to change people's beliefs uh, and, and change how people act and speak in their everyday lives. And I, and I retold that story. You referenced uh, an article that I published a couple days ago at Free the People. Um, and I believe the title was Not Every Man Lives, um, channeling the William Wallace quote. And I was, I was telling my personal story essentially to try to explain to people the concept of opportunity cost and under lockdowns, particularly for someone like myself that is keenly aware that every moment lived is one less moment that I will live and that the clock is ticking and I want to live um, life to its fullest. And maybe I have a much higher level of risk tolerance because of some of the things I've been through personally, but, but trying to get people that that think it's okay for the government to lock you down in your home, that think it's absolutely irresponsible for anyone to go out for any reason, um, that is an emotional reaction against risk. And I understand what it is, but I want them to understand that some of us have, have a different perspective. And, and me having spent the last year not allowed to do a lot of the things that I would have done previously is, is, is really the worst thing you could do to me as a, as a fellow human being. And, and all of that conversation was really, um, I, I could have given a quote from Mises about opportunity cost, but, but I don't think it would have had the same effect. And, and the other part of that, I, um, one of my personal heroes, and this gets into my sort of libertarian origin stories, is, is a guy named Neil Peart, who was the drummer and lyricist for Rush, he actually just passed away about a year ago um, from a brain tumor. But in his lyrics, his lyrics were, were very libertarian, particularly when he was younger. 
Um, he's the guy that turned me on to Ayn Rand. Um, but as he got older, and even when he was still probably in his early 30s, he was obsessed about the passage of time. And he had this personal motto. Um, every day he would wake up and say, what is the most excellent thing I can do today? And it, to me, that is, that is kind of Howard Rourke personified. What am I going to do that makes me satisfied that I didn't waste that day doing something that someone else wanted me to do? It's and a great philosophy, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a... There's a dash of Bill and Ted in there, too, which I love. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but it, it's kind of like, it, today? it's kind of self-helpy, right? Like, how do you, how do you live your best life? And it, it might sign, sound trite, but if, if you don't try to figure that out every day, um, you're going you're gonna to be disappointed with how things turn out. All right, kiddies, I got to take a quick time out here to tell you about one of our great sponsors. And if you don't want to be disappointed with how your life turns out, if you don't want to have any regrets, you might want to look into something a lot of people have been looking into, and that is looking into a life overseas, uh, a second passport, a backup plan, because my friends... Things aren't always rosy here in the States, uh, and the way things are going, especially if you've heard interviews uh, with people like Vin Armani that I've had on the show, things might not be getting a lot better. So a lot of people have been looking into the idea of living and investing abroad, and it never hurts to have a backup plan. In fact, I would call it essential to have a backup plan, and the best way to have a backup plan for living outside the United States is to have the ability to do so, setting yourself up with second passports, with visas, with investments overseas, because we cannot always count on what we think we can count on, my friends. So I encourage you to check out the Expat Money Show, hosted by my friend Mikkel Thorup. Mikkel has lived the expat life and walked the walk. He has been doing this for over 20 years, starting his own businesses, living overseas. Uh, there is no better resource to learn from than Mikkel Thorup. So I want you to go ahead and subscribe to the Expat Money Money Show, wherever you listen to podcasts, there you'll be able to join a great Facebook forum that I actually help moderate where we discuss these ideas. So I want to encourage you to listen, subscribe to the Expat Money Show, and come join us in the forum over at expatmoneyforum.com. So when you had that first conversation with that doctor, when they really realized what was going on there, I, were you given like odds? I mean, they had this drug, but it hadn't been approved until I think you know, a few years prior. Did they say like, we're pretty sure we can take care of this if you do this now? Or I mean, what, how, what was your level of concern that you were not going to make it through this? Yeah. Like, um, and the, the reason I didn't know, so I'm diagnosed and they see this big mass in my abdomen, um, because of the risk of, of spreading the cancer, they did not do a biopsy until I could get on the surgical table, which is where this, this two weeks of hell came from. And I vividly remember Terry and I going to then see the surgeon and he had, he, he drew this really crappy picture of a human body. And, and he's basically telling me all of the body parts I might lose in the midst of the surgery. And at the end of it, I'm, I'm looking at all the body parts that are gone. I'm like, I'm not going to survive that. And I didn't say it that way. I was, I was far more devastated by it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to go uh, get a living will. We had to go make sure that, that um, Terry was okay because we had a mortgage and all that stuff. And I wanted to make sure that she could keep her house and all that kind of things. And, and we were young and, and you're in your, what, like your early thirties, I think you said, right? Uh, like mid to late thirties. Yeah. And you know, we, we thought we were invincible, like everyone in their thirties thinks. And so we had to do all that stuff that, that you have to do when you get a death sentence. And, and, that really sucked, as you can imagine. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm not done yet. I haven't done the things that I set out to do. Um, but you can imagine the opposite reaction the moment we discovered that this was a treatable thing. And they, they didn't uh, remove anything surgically because um, tumors, tumors wrap around things and you could do a lot of in, uh, damage to inter internal organs. And they had this relatively new chemotherapy treatment that was specifically super effective on seminoma tumors. So they just stitched me up and I immediately started this three months of aggressive chemotherapy treatment, which was, was not fun. But for me, I knew that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So my, 
my natural libertarian stubbornness actually became an asset at that point because I was just going to power through it. Was it uh, almost, uh, I'm sure it wasn't pleasurable in any way, but it was it almost a good hurt in the sense that you're you're feeling this pain, feeling what's happening to your body, but you know that, that's, that the cancer is feeling that pain too, that, that that's what's really being attacked and that's what your body's feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, I mean, chemo is scheduled um, and there, there was no reason to believe that I wouldn't necessarily have to do it again, but I, I knew that there was a three month one week on, I think it was three weeks off because this is, this stuff was super devastating to your body. So you're, you're just super wiped out after it. And by the way, each treatment is cumulative. So by the end of it, you, you feel like you're gonna, you're gonna die. But I had a goal, I had a time and I knew that at the end of that, if everything went well, I would have achieved my goal. Um, I can't imagine what it's like if you don't really have a goal. That's a different scenario. And I, su- I assume that's a lot tougher for cancer patients who don't really know if what they're doing is going to work. So you have this mm-hmm. sort of personal cost benefit. Is all of this suffering going to lead back to a point where I can live my life? And I understand why some people ultimately decide not to, to take another round of chemotherapy because there's there's no upside. So in your case, they were very certain that this was going to be able to be cured if you could just get through this, these very, this very rough treatment. Yeah, they were, they were, they were very confident and, and even, you know, the, the internet was not what it is today, but the research told me that, that the, the, the survival rate with this new treatment was over 90%. And obviously spoiler alert, I, I lived. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And, um, Man, there's there's so much so much I want to dig into with this. Um, I, I guess I just want to talk a little bit more first about just just ha- what you were going through internally. Like, okay, so first, of course, you're going through the actual cancer itself, and your goal is just to live and, and get through that. But then once you got that clean bill of health, I, I'm kind of curious how that changed how you looked at life going forward. I know you already discussed a bit about you know what it you know how you look at time and and time with loved ones, t- the time you have here on this earth. But what are some specific things that you did differently in your life? Whether they're, I mean. I, I don't know if what your health was like before this, if you can even relate cancer to anything, you know, anything in your actual lifestyle, or if you were as healthy as you could possibly be. And this just happened to you because it happened to you for whatever reason. But I, I'm just kind of curious, what, what changes did you take in your life once you got that clean bill of health and once you had that, that outlook saying, but man, I just, I just faced death right down and I, and I got through it and now I have to make the most of this. Yeah. So it, uh, professionally and, and, I'm one of those guys that, that it completely blurs my personal and professional life. Both Terry and I have been Liberty guys for almost our entire professional careers. So we have always worked all the time. And I use, I'll use the word work in danger quotes because I don't, you know, we, we definitely grind stuff out, but it's, this is, this is a passion. Like this is, this is our chosen uh, profession as opposed to the thing that we have to do to put food on the table. So the, the thing that a second lease on life gave me, it, it very much radicalized me um, at a time when I had a lot of professional frustrations and I had, there were a lot of pressures on me to sort of fall in line with um, the Republican Party and two-team politics and all of that. And I would attribute, and, and we went through all sorts of, uh, um, professional challenges and hostile takeovers and all sorts of drama that if, if people want to go read about that, they can. But um, out of that came a willingness to take bigger risks, a willingness to, to, to represent in a more truer form the values of liberty that I had been instilled with when I was 13 years old listening to a Rush album. Um, because I knew I didn't have all the time in the world. And, and when you think you have all the time in the world, you sort of, you're willing to compromise a little bit more say, well, maybe we should back off from that fight and not pursue that goal. But, but, you know, I became quite anxious about getting something done so that the next time I was lying on my deathbed, I didn't have to say to myself, I'm not done yet. Um, so out of that, for instance, and I think this is probably the last time we talked, I, I think I might've still been a, um, at least at the end of my career as a, as a tea party organizer. And out of that came the risk to organize that massive March on Washington and the insistence, um, 
at least as long as I was involved, that 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 community, for all of its disparate factions, it was going to be anchored in in some some libertarian values, like not spending money you don't have, like respecting constitutional limits on power, like um, opposing an executive branch that wanted to govern through executive order. And by the way, if there's any Tea Partiers that were supporting Trump, they threw away that entire ethos. Um, so it, I, I think it enabled me to do some really cool things professionally and even, even free the people. Like as, as, as I saw that the, the Tea Party and that whole political machine that we had helped build, as I saw it sliding into nationalism, sliding in, into kind of a cult of personality, I realized that, that we needed to do something radically different. Um, the same mechanics that helped create the Tea Party, technology, a democratization of, of knowledge and ability to self-organize, we as libertarians were missing an opportunity to reach a much broader audience. Tea Party politics was cadre building politics. And our mission today, yours and mine, is reaching a very broad audience outside of our tribe, outside of left versus right, Republican versus Democrat. Um, there's this massive audience out there that we call the Liberty Curious. And so I had to leave everything I was doing and start over. And I, I'm not sure I would have done that based on the conventional wisdom of, of how you build a career. But I was keenly aware that I only had so much time to get this done. And if I waited, I would I would waste that time. Yeah, I mean, especially after after being through that, like you said, you don't want to have something, God forbid, like this come up again and think to myself, oh, why did I not just do that? Why did I not launch Free the People, this organization that was in my mind? Why did I just keep doing what I was doing? And now having this attitude, having been through that, you, you probably can never do that again. You can probably never leave something on the floor, some something that you thought you might be passionate about. Uh, you're probably going to have to pursue anything that you start to feel some passionate about because you never want to have that feeling. You never want to get to that point and say, oh man, if only I just, why didn't I just pursue this one thing, this one thing yeah. that I had in my mind? Yeah. And I mean, I, I think it, I think it applies to where we are today because you and I could spend an hour talking about how shitty things are, Easily, how the, ri yeah. <laughs> the rise of democratic socialism and the rise of nationalism and, and this, this seeming um, popular idea that if we just get control of the Iron Throne, we can finally force everyone to live the way we live. Um, to me, I think we're in the middle of something. Like I, I think, I think all of this chaos that Trump exploited, that Bernie Sanders exploited, that the Tea Party exploited, that Ron Paul exploited, that even Howard Dean, going all the way back to the the, the Dean scream, um, this was all triggered by technology liberating people from the top-down institutions, particularly in politics, but, but media, all of that stuff, all that stuff that used to tell you what to think. And now people had the means to sort of fact check the, the authorities. And that process of getting from, you know, very, you know, Walter Cronkite telling us what to think to governing in a very bottom-up democratic way. And I use governing instead of government because they're two different things. Um, I think we're trying to figure out how to get along with each other and how to break down tribal barriers. So I'm still, I'm still clinging to that romanticism that I saw. Like if you read my last book, I'm super romantic about social media and the democratization of knowledge. I still think we can get there, but we need to, to really focus on that and offer people an alternative to tribalism. And I, th I think I think liberty is really the only social platform that is tolerant of our differences. And, and we actually celebrate our differences because in a free world, um, our differences become strengths and become opportunities co to collaborate and cooperate and do something more beautiful together than we could do alone. Um, we have that model, but we're never going to convince anybody or connect with people. I don't even like the word convince, but connect with people if we're out there talking about the non-aggression principle and and these libertarians are fighting with those libertarians and we're busy pushing people out of our tiny little tent um 
I'm against all that. I, I think it's big and beautiful and we should be talking to everybody. I think something uh, you said there when you, you said, you know, I don't want to say convince. And I think that's what so many of us get wrapped up in, whether it's, you know, trying to pitch the ideas of liberty or just anything in politics, anything in life, really. We, we as humans, when we're passionate about something, we feel the need to convince everybody else of that same thing, whether it's libertarianism whether it's veganism, CrossFit, yoga, we're all we're all guilty of something somewhere probably on, on this line. Uh, but when you were when you're setting out to convince someone, it really hardly ever works. That's why we have all these tropes of oh yeah, the CrossFitters always talking about CrossFit, always talking about yoga because they're passionate and they can't shut the fuck up about it. Um, it can become annoying, and I know that the same thing happens to libertarians. The same thing happened with me. I was one of those annoying Ron Paul people that just hosted probably the same videos over and over and over, just, just convinced that. Certainly, if I just tell enough people, they're going to get it. How could they not? I did. I became so passionate about this stuff. But, you know, people come to things in very different ways. And most people don't come to ideas the way I the way that I did or, you know, the way that they were hammered at me and I just embraced them and, and completely agree with them and completely bought it hook, line and sinker. That's not how most people come into just about anything. Um, so how do we sort of adjust our approach? I, I think the one thing that's interesting about the time we're in here, you know, in terms of technology is there's so much more diversity of thought, like the, the Ron Paul revolution, even like you said, even the Tea Party, these things don't happen without the te technology of the internet, without having the ability to sort of um, de organize in a decentralized way. Uh, at the same time, where we are here in 2020, 2021, I, I forgot the year, um, it seems like this technology now has brought us to a point, maybe it's not just the technology, maybe it's just how it's being steered, but now it's 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 become where everything is so hyper-partisan that you can't even take a, a normal position on something without being lumped into an extreme of another side. I mean, even just the word liberty now, uh, you have it in your in your podcast, Kippity on Liberty, I have it here in Lions of Liberty. That word for so many people now is just, okay, liberty, Republican, Trump, MAGA, racist, Nazi, it's all the same thing. So like, how do we communicate our ideas, communicate what they are, uh, and not be sucked into that that sort of hyper-partisan trap and not be just lumped into these categories where it seems everybody is either, is in some kind of category now. You're either, you're either you know, part of the establishment line or you're a Nazi. It seems like there's hardly anything in between at this point. Yeah, yeah, and it, I'm, I'm hyper- curious and sensitive about the use of language uh, resulting from the dynamic you're describing and and it i've i've had a, a lot of opportunity to to hang out with uh progressives um i'm part of a working group of progressives and and when i joined that about five years ago i dis I, I i noticed how difficult it was to understand what they were talking about because they were using their tribal language and they have a i mean it's all english right but but they have uh embedded meaning in words and they have phrases that they use that were completely alien to me and then i came back to my libertarian tribe and i heard us doing the same thing even though i understood exactly what they were saying um, but i realized that that normal people outside of our little tribes have no idea what we're talking about so i i try to be very conscious of of when I use the word libertarian, it's um, I agree with Hayek. I, it's a frustrating word to me. It's it's kind of a a made up word, and I would have preferred to use the word liberal, but that doesn't necessarily mean to most people what we think it means, and so on and so on and so on. So I was uh, I had a sort of an intellectual reset when I had Penn Jillette on on my podcast, and I think I asked him. Um, and we we're talking about how how global capitalism so clearly lifts people out of poverty. And, and I'm like, how do we convince people? It seems so obvious to us. How do we convince people? And he scolded me. He's like, <laughs> there are you we are trying, trying to, to convince again, man. Yeah. Yeah. Are we trying to convince people? And and I've sort of evolved, and this is it's kind of a half-baked idea, but I feel like um every human being, with the exception of a few of us that have this 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 fairly fleshed out worldview of in our case, libertarianism, but but there could be other people that sort of interpret the world through either economics or a philosophical platform. But most people don't do that. It's it's kind of a it's a grab bag of experiences and and biases and and theories about about how they interpret the world around them. So I'm thinking that the way that we advance these ideas of human flourishing 
is by listening a little bit more to people that disagree with us by trying to understand where they're coming from and looking for um, sort of spontaneous ways that we can gather on issues of, of common interest. And a good example of this is I, I just had Thomas Massey and Tulsi Gabbard on my show talking about their efforts to repeal the Patriot Act. Um, I'm sure they disagree on something. I'm, I'm not naive to think that, that we're all sort of, sort of straight down the, the, the narrow libertarians, but that's, that's, a, that's a fundamental issue, right? And, and by the way, there's, there's dozens of fundamental issues that those two and myself, and we all come from different perspectives, we could find common ground on a lot of stuff. And I think that's, that's one thing that the, the libertarian parties kind of have to come to terms with. And, and my own view is that you can be a true libertarian, capital T, capital L, and we should probably trademark that phrase um, <laughs> so that we can we can denounce other people for not being true enough, but you can be that guy and still be really interested in a broad coalition of, of the willing to quote George W. Bush. Um, cause if, if our goal is to get everyone to be a true libertarian, I think that's, I think that's a, a fool's errand, but could we find those few common values that unite almost all Americans, not everybody, but almost all Americans. And it's stuff your mom taught you. Don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Simple stuff like, like uh, mutual respect. And that to me is where the mainstreaming of libertarian values can happen. But we, we, have to, we have to get used to the fact that we're not just a little cadre anymore. We have an opportunity to build something big and beautiful. Yeah. And a lot of people just don't want to be an Aryan or uh, they don't want to be a libertarian. They don't want to be an anything Aryan. They don't, they don't want to be a political label of any kind. Like that's, that's not how the majority of people think. Uh, I, at least in my experience, the majority of people are, are fairly apolitical in the sense they most people are not attached to the tribe that we get maybe a 20% on each side that is super hardcore for whatever reason that the way they were raised or something in their brain, they're just hardcore Republican conservative or what have you or hardcore Democrat progressive. Most people are not looking for that. So if we're taking that approach, when we try to find people and we're saying, hey, become a libertarian, even if we're trying to make them become something we've already pushed them away because they're saying, well, I, I'm not trying to be anything. I don't know if I'm a libertarian. Why do I have to think about that? But those same people, if you just talk to them like human beings and you happen to talk about a number of different subjects that come up, you might actually find out that this person who would never want to be called a libertarian in their life might agree with you on eight out of 10 issues, you know, <laughs> especially when you approach them, not as trying to convince them of something, when you approach them as trying to just have a conversation with them and find the things that find the common ground that as humans, most people really do want. Like you said, you wrote the book. It's, it's very simple. Most people just don't want to be hurt and just don't want to have their stuff taken at, at, at the end of the day. Most people just want to live their lives, provide for their family, uh, do things that bring them joy in life, uh, pursue the things that they are passionate about. That's what people want at the end of the day. And yes, you and I believe strongly that libertarian ideas and free markets provide that for the most people. But most people aren't thinking in that in that order. They're not thinking political philosophy gets me here. They're thinking, I want to live my life. I want to do these things, except there's these other people coming at me with their politics and I just have to navigate through it. Yeah. And I, um, and I, I am stuck. You like, it's funny because the title of that book is don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. And then the subtitle is a libertarian manifesto. <laughs> so I, I had to put the code word on there for people that, that did belong to my tribe, but that, that is not what people, when they see the book cover, um, I've tried in this, uh, we do this series called the deadly isms and it's, it's a way of sort of debunking this left versus right thing. And this, this ridiculous notion that somehow, um, mass murder by Mao is somehow fundamentally different than mass murder by Hitler, even though one's on the far left and one's on the far right. So we take the political spectrum and turn it on its head and put the isms at the bottom, uh, authoritarianism in all of its horrible flavors. And as you work your way up from authoritarianism, at the very top of that is cooperation. And I'm struggling to use words that don't have an ism at the end of it above the line where you get at the, the various um, free ways that, that people can, can organize. 
Um, but you know, we still fall into the ism thing. Like when we talk about libertarianism, right? Voluntary ism. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it would be better. And, and by the way, replacing an ism with a word like cooperation, cooperation is one of those universally held human values that I haven't, I haven't pulled it, but I'm guessing that most people are pro cooperation. Right. It's not an ideology that people have an extreme opinion about one, one yeah. way or the other. Most yeah. people want to cooperate for the most part. Yeah. And that, and that's the hope. Like if most people don't want to cooperate, we're probably in for some pretty dark times. <laughs> and we're in trouble no matter what our politics are. Yeah. We're, we're headed to the zombie apocalypse. Well, Matt, it's been awesome. Uh, it's been awesome catching up with you. And, uh, you know, uh, one thing I really love about not really planning my subjects of, that I'm going to talk about, you know, I think we scheduled this interview a couple of days ago before I had ever even, even read that article about your, your cancer and wasn't something that I had you know, scheduled this intending to talk about um, until a couple of days ago, I thought, well, maybe we should touch on that. And I, I'm glad we did a lot more than touch on that. I'm glad we really dove into it because I think there's some truly, truly valuable, valuable lessons that people can take. Of course, politically, people can learn a lot of valuable lessons uh, based on, you know, the, you know, just the concepts you lay out there about access to marijuana, about access to the drug of uh, being held up for 20 years, but so much more beyond that. I think people can really learn from your personal experience and how you dealt with that going through that and then what you've done with your life since then. Uh, I think and, and I'm sure you would agree your life would not, not necessarily, you might not be sitting here having the same conversation with me, uh, as the, you know, president, founder and commu chief community organizer of free the people. If you had not gone through that, maybe you would have, who knows? Uh, but certainly things would have played out a lot differently. Yeah. That, are you, are you going to be at pork fest this year? That's the plan. We haven't, we cool. haven't, uh, solidified it yet, but that is the plan. Yeah. Hopefully I'll see you there and we can, uh, hang out and, uh, get a, get a breath of freedom. Indeed, indeed. Look forward to it. Matt, uh, before I let you go, just give the uh, one last roundup of everything you got going. I know you have Kibbe on Liberty over there at The Blaze, as well as on, on Free the People, and you've just got so many different projects within that, especially over at Free the People. You guys are just doing tremendous work there, so feel free to uh, plug away on everything you got going on. And if you haven't seen it yet, check out uh, a documentary that we released last year called How to Love Your Enemy, a restorative justice story, and it's uh, to me a in, an example of the kind of storytelling that we're trying to get at, because you could do a documentary about the, the philosophy of justice reform, or you could just tell a human story. And, and we tried to do it there. So if you, if you want to get a sense for the, the kinds of things we're trying to do, that's a good place to, to check it out anywhere that you consume video. All right. Well, Matt Kibbe, keep up the great work. And uh, we're hoping to uh, see you at Porkfest and have a few Liberty Brewskis with you. Cool. Talk to you. Take care, Matt. All right, kiddies, before we wrap things up here, I got to tell you real quick about our friends at Lorenzotti Italy. Do you like coffee? Do you like premium Italian coffee? Do you like it affordably delivered to your house? Well, guess who does that? Our friends at Lorenzotti Italy. You can find them at lorenzotti.coffee. That's lorenzotti.coffee. I will also link to that in today's show notes. And I really want to encourage you to support these guys because they are not just fine connoisseurs and procurers. Is that a word? Procurers? Procurers? You know what I'm trying to say of fine Italian coffee. But they are also great libertarians, great supporters of this program, patrons of this program uh, for over a year now as well as great entrepreneurs and people who help others. So they also, in addition to getting fine premium coffee delivered to your house, they can also help you set up your own coffee business, whether it's uh, getting equipment, getting financing, trying to set up your own coffee shop. These are the guys to go to. So they really are a one-stop shop for whether you're a coffee lover or whether you're trying to get into that niche as an entrepreneur. So please do check out our friends at Lauren Zotti Italy at laurenzotti.coffee and use discount code LIONS for 10% off your order. All right, friends, that does it for this week. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Matt Kibbe as much as I did. Uh, I think we can really, really learn uh, some life lessons, some political lessons for sure, but some life lessons mostly here uh, by hearing uh, about Matt and what he went through with his cancer. Very, very inspiring stuff. And that's what I hope to do here each and every week on the flagship here. Inspire you. Inspire you to find more liberty in your own lives. And uh, you can also do so the rest of the week, of course, because it's not just me here, my friends. We've also got the venerable Brian McWilliams every single Wednesday with his weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty on Electric Liberty Land. 
while John Oder Matt wraps things up on Fridays on Finding Freedom, formerly Felony Friday, where John will still often bring you some hard hitting stories of people who have overcome incredible odds navigating the broken criminal justice system, but is also expanding his reach, expanding that conversation to wherever the heck he wants, because that is what this thing is all about. That is freedom right there. Really helps him expand his scope as a podcaster. So check out all of our great shows. You get all three each and every week. For the price of one, that price is free. All you got to do is smash that subscribe button on Apple, on Stitcher, wherever it is you listen to podcasts. And please do leave us a five-star rating and a great review while you're there. And if all of that is just not enough for you, you can get even more content over on our Patreon. You can help support this show by joining the Pride over at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty, where you get all sorts of exclusive bonus content, including Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers on a little bit of a hiatus, but we'll be coming back shortly, bonus live streams, discounts on merchandise, all sorts of great perks in the Pride. And of course, you also get early access to a lot of my interviews. So members of the Pride have already heard next week's interview with a man who has just been involved in just about every industry you can be in. He has been a lawyer, an actor. He has worked for presidents. Uh, He is a man by the name of Ben Stein. Many of you know him, of course, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Bueller, Bueller, but this guy has done a lot. Uh, He does have political opinions. We do get into them, but really it is a, a story of a fascinating person who has just done so much in life. So I'm very much looking forward to releasing that interview next week. Uh, and Ben enjoyed that interview so much that he invited me to participate in his show, The World According to Ben Stein. I got to appear on that show this past weekend. I will link to that episode in the show notes. I had a really interesting time along with our friend Gary Collins, who's been on this show before, talking to Ben and his friend Judah about libertarian ideas, about how Republicans, if they really want to capture that libertarian vote, how they can uh, pander, so to speak, to the libertarian crowd. So I had a blast doing that show. Be sure to check it out, The World According to Ben Stein. My friends, that is all I have this week. Until next time. Live long and live free.